Now, let me first introduce our four distinguished guests of today. First, there's Stefan Larsson. He's, he's a senior lecturer and associate professor in technology and social change at Lund University in Sweden. Then there's Judith Simon. She's a professor of ethics and information technologies at the University of Hamburg. We have Jo Pearson, who's a professor in the Department of Media and Communication Studies at the Free University, the Vrije Universiteit in Brussels. Welcome, Jo. And then we have Alison Powell. She is an associate professor in the Department of Media and Communication at the London School of Economics and Political Science. Thank you very much, all of you, for joining today. Um, before we actually start, I would like to say a few words about the theme that we're going to cover this afternoon. We're currently witnessing a, significant, a very significant paradigm shift in the way that we trust our communication and our media systems. We're actually moving from an institutional professional model of trust towards a computational corporate model of trust. And this first model is the, the institutional professional model of trust is predicated on human made rules of power that are governed by publicly accountable institutions and professional. Whereas the second one, the second model is predicated on personalized data flows, algorithmic computation and proprietary business models, which dynamics actually yields the, um, uh, uh, the obscure rules of power. Now, the shift between those models can be identified, for instance, in journalism, where a traditionally high trust framework, which a framework which is anchored by institutional and professional norms, is gradually taken over by a low trust Internet environment where news distribution, for instance, is governed by algorithms and driven by data, by data flows. Now, within this internet environment, the dynamics are increasingly governed by a handful of global, global platforms, and I don't need to mention their names because all of you know them. And this shift affects not only how we trust media organizations as institutional frames for shaping news, for shaping information, but it also affects our daily practices and routines of communication, which can now take on the form of not only one-to-one -one communication, but also one-to-many and many-to-many and -many channels of communication. Now, this paradigm shift also raises the issue of power. On the one hand, ordinary users may feel empowered to produce and disseminate information and participate in a public debate. And people like us who are now communicated through the screen may feel empowered to do so. On the other hand, though, the few companies I just mentioned and their control over information distribution and production means that power is increasingly concentrated in the hands of a few big technology companies, and they are defining and shaping the conditions for platformed communication. So platformization, as I you know, usually call that, platformization also affects the dynamics between governments and citizens, talking about governance. Some of these dynamics are baked into the technical conditions that steer those platforms and which require interventions in its technical design. But other interventions may need the hand of government, governments and policymakers. So that is also part of the theme that we're going to explore. So let me put a number of questions on the table today. Questions like how should European societies reorganize or reshape their platform societies or their societies as you know platforms uh, mediated environments do governments and civil society have enough power to shape their media and communications uh, communi communication channels and their infrastructures particularly those infrastructures that are out of reach becoming out of reach for many of these governments can we develop new mechanisms for establishing trust, for establishing trustworthiness in the context of online communication and digital platforms? That sort of you know, lays out the themes that we will be discussing this afternoon. And in this session, I will ask you to each of you, you know, taking turns, I will ask each of you to present your perspectives on this team. It's a very broad discussion. You may narrow it down if you like, you may come up with examples. Um, but we will do this in two rounds. And after you know those two rounds, we'll see how many questions there are and, and whether we have time for a wrap up. But first, let me start with the first round. I will ask you, each of you, 
to identify, to identify one example of a major problem with regards to the way that in which we are, as a society, we are governed by platforms. This is a term that you probably recognize from Tarleton Gillespie. How are we governed by platforms? Preferably explain that problem from your disciplinary perspective. All each four of you have a different discipline, I noticed. Um, as well as from your national and geographic perspective, we also have four different countries, European countries uh, we presented here this afternoon. I will give each of you some three or four to five minutes max to answer this question. And let me start to give the floor to Stefan Larsson first. Stefan, the screen is all yours. Uh, thank you very much. First, uh, we seem so uh, used to Zoom now that we all stay sort of muted <laughs> in a very, you know, nice way. So the, the, the talk is harder to, to you know, uh, interrupt each other and stuff like that. But uh, thanks of all, first, for a great uh, framing uh, of this panel. Um, my background as a lawyer and sort of a social legal researcher, I've, I've got a PhD in sociology of law, is uh, when I'm looking at platformization and platforms, I think uh, mainly in terms of, uh, uh, you know, how do we, how have states developed governance and the methodologies of governance? Um, that's, that is one challenge I see here, uh, uh, often linked to transparency issues. So firstly then, you can think of states, we have had um, Roman law in our contemporary reg regulation. So we had struggled at least for 2000 years in terms of uh, legal uh, methodologies or legal process, uh, which is a long time. And you can have many things to say about, you know, how governments handle things, but it has at least had a couple of hundred years of, of good thought uh, in, in how to deal with the procedures when it comes to normative decision making. Whereas when you look at uh, the contemporary large scale platforms, which contain users or sort of citizens in a sense uh, in the billions, they've thought about normative process more in terms of months than uh, centuries. So that's one of, that's, that's one of the challenges actually. It's uh, in, insanely hard to find the right balances in how to have that interface between normative decision making and you know make the calls of what's right, what's wrong, uh, on an individual basis. Uh, uh, you know the scale is one thing, but sort of the time to to find the balances in that sort of decision making is uh, another challenge, a big problem actually. Then, um, um, I think that uh, I really like when uh, you and others have stressed sort of from platforms to platformization because then it becomes sort of a logic. It's not only, uh, you know, five uh, organizations, it's more sort of a way to do things. Uh, um, and I'm thinking about uh, maybe media sociologist Anderson Schwartz talks about uh, a platform logic. And I'm thinking about um, um, the infrastructuralization that Sean Christophe Plantin also and others sort of talk about. So you, you talk about it as an infrastructure and something that a logic that can also travel to traditional institutions, you know, traditional retailers or traditional uh, other companies. And then they try to follow this logic because it's efficient perhaps, or it's uh, a way to scale. You can handle billions or millions of users instead of thousands with a limited amount of organization around it. But it, it ultimately means datafication. You have to, you know, uh, find out to handle information in a non sort of fiscal way so you can scale up and, and automate as much as possible. And with scalability and automation also, also these sort of govern, government issues too. It's really hard to handle decisions on, you know, what, what video uh, is, is, is okay to show if you have 500 hours of video uploaded each minute, that decision-making, that normative decision-making has to be automated. And with that automation, it's really hard to sort of uh, yeah, take the correct decision. Right. Your answer proves that the governance of platforms is definitely sort of complex, inter, uh, complexly interrelated with uh, our uh, being governed by platforms. So that is an interesting yeah. uh, correlation here. Now, let me go to Judith Simon. Judith, would you like to reflect on that question? Yeah, I initially thought about reacting immediately on, on a very German perspective on what you just mentioned, this, this governance, uh, because we had this 
sort of like famous or infamous network uh, enforcement act, which is basically all about to what extent and who should decide about what content should be taken down with all the pros and cons in regards to, on the one hand, preventing, let's say, hate speech on the one hand side or disinformation and misinformation is two different um, you know, effects you want to avoid. And the contra side is, of course, that you may encounter overblocking because it is automated, because it's easier, or censorship. So this would be a direct reaction of what Stefan just said before. Initially, because you asked also for a disciplinary perspective, maybe just swapping the side, because I'm, I'm, I'm originally trained as a, as a psychologist, but have been working in philosophy for the last years, and in particular in social epistemology. So what interested me are the effects that certain um, setups and, and ways of presenting information impact the knowledge processes of the of the user, so to speak. So what does it mean that that information is presented following certain logics, uh, which are not necessarily that uh, not necessarily the same interest that 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 users have in providing and getting accurate information. So what what does it mean for what I would call epistemic trust? So how can I trust the information that is being presented? What strategies do I have at hand to weigh um, uh, to weigh this evidence. So these, these are questions that basically, because philosophers are basically very little interested in raising trust, but rather in having less trust, um, because most of the stuff uh, we trust is basically untrustworthy. So what we are interested in is how do you basically figure out what's trustworthy and then allocate your trust in a justified manner, basically. And maybe just as a last word, if, if you may, because you mentioned the special issue, and I'm actually not an expert on the Network uh, Enforcement Act, but what we investigated in the special issue is rather the Corona One app, uh, which is basically an app which is intended to notify people uh, whether they have been exposed or in the proximity of other people who have later on um, uh, notified that they are infected so that people get a notification that they have been in the proximity of other people who were uh, corona positive. And that was quite an interesting German case study because there have been lots of debates in Germany on how exactly to set this up and to what extent this can be built in a trustworthy manner, who should be participating, whether, you know, what, what role do experts play, what role does civil society play in order to set up a tool that is supposed to help the public to a certain way. And it also links back to the platforms because at the very end decisions about whether or not something is centralized or not centralized depend on prior decisions of major companies such as Apple and Google in regards to what they allow on their platforms. And I hope I made a bit of a loop uh, in my report. <laughs> sure. And just one more question, uh, Judith. Uh, do Germans actually trust technology very much? Do they trust technology more than, for instance, people in other European countries? What do you think? What is your hunch? My hunch would be that they that they are more skeptical and that it depends probably on the type of technology. So they probably trust cars a bit more than other people do. <laughs> uh, but my, but my hunch would be that they are more skeptical when it comes to have apps and other types of technologies. And what about the Corona app? Do they, uh, the German people actually trust the Corona app? Not really. Um, I would say there has been, I think initially there has been, this has, I think in the in the production phase, in the phase when it was developed, this was actually a very positive story because there was a change in direction from a centralized system towards a decentralized system. And this was backed up by civil, uh, civil organization that supported this road and also by experts. Afterwards, a lot went wrong because the communication has been wrong, because there has been a lot of misinformation about how the app works and what the problems are. There has been a lot of blaming. So as much as high as the hopes were, what this app would bring in terms of you know, downsizing or reducing the infection rates, um, so big was the disappointment now. So there is a lot of bashing of this Corona app. There have been a lot of mistakes made after release. I think the process up to release was, was good. The process after release is improvable and now there have been lots of debates and this is actually a topic uh, which annoyed the hell out of me, uh, the <laughs> amount of, of, of you know, harmful information that has been spread in regards to what is all not working in Germany due to data protection. Right. Thank you so much. Um, next uh, on, in line is uh, Jo Pearson from Brussels. Jo, can you enlighten us on these problems and would you like, by the way, do you have an, a, a Corona app in Belgium? Uh, yes. Is it is considered trustworthy? 
Uh, to large extent, yes, although the uptake, as in many other countries, is not as originally expected. Uh, and we, uh, our research center did a survey where we asked people about, would you adopt this kind of app? And th there was a lot of distrust on what will happen with the data on this app and so on. So the uptake is quite okay, but not as large as would be expected. They have this uh, threshold, I think, of 70, 75%. That would be ideal. I think we are largely not there, like 50, 55%. But still, it's, 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 it's been seen generally as, as, as a quite okay app. Also, there's a, like quite some media coverage about who developed this app. And there was a whole consortium behind it of privacy experts with one of their leaders being a, a, a kind of a, a, a computer science scholar from Belgium. So to the general extent, the answer would be yes, I think. Okay. Would you like to um, broadly reply to the question that I asked about mm -hmm. the governance of platforms and yeah. um, how that is how that is taken from your academic perspective and from your geographic perspective? Yes, yes. I'm looking at it from, of course, my perspective is media communication studies uh, with a with a link towards uh, science and technology studies where may, most of my research looks into the user perspective. So trying to understand what is happening with these platforms, but especially also what is happening with these platforms from the perspectives of perspective and the practices of users. And one of my main points would be the, the trust paradox for the user, meaning that what you see is, to give one example, messaging apps as one of the many platforms, is that users often feel compelled to start using these kind of socially indispensable apps and platforms. But at the same time, while doing that, making them also dependent on the corporate control mechanisms that are there, if they are visible at all for users there. And so what is, what is in fact, and when I we were try to dissect it, what I kind of frame it is, yeah, you have this kind of social infrastructure from the idea that it becomes a kind of a basic social utility to use several, several kinds of platforms like the Corona app and Corona times, but also like messaging app to engage with social environment. On the one hand, you have this as it be, being put forward also by the platforms themselves and also experienced by the users as social infrastructure. While at the same time, what you see is that they, of course, are built upon a very extended and very fine grained corporate computational infrastructure based on business and technical motives and drives and, and, and how it's being set up. And the point is that if you want to be sure that that these apps are doing what they're doing in the benefit of public values in Europe, and for example, you would need to be sure that the, the way that people become dependent on these apps is not being leveraged for unethical, non-value-based uh, non or the wrong values or, or, or disregarding values in the sense of, of surveillance, privacy, manipulation, all the stuff we are experiencing, the kind of things that are happening with this data. So, it's, it's up to, uh, it's in a sense, that you want to disentangle what is happening with the data and does, is it in the benefit of citizens? Uh, a nice example, I think, would be there what happened with uh, recently in the beginning of the year with Signal and Telegram as being these kind of messaging apps that have this pri more privacy-oriented perspective. At the moment that, what, that uh, WhatsApp announced that it would start sharing its, its data with Facebook, really not a surprise for, of course, many of us, but Apparently, for many people, it was kind of leveraging, making, surfacing something which they didn't know about, that there was this infrastructure that created data and then would transfer them to Facebook for one reason or another. And as a backlash, you saw that a huge amount of people at that moment shifted from WhatsApp to Signal and, and even more Telegram. Although there were very small apps in the fringe, especially known by privacy scholars and so on, but they became prominent at a certain moment. So this shows for me at least that what's at stake is to in, it's indeed to kind of surface these kind of, of uh, this kind of infrastructure which is behind the scenes and make people aware of it and making acting on that. In the end, it would be even better if platforms themselves, of course, would do that by themselves, but we are apparently not there yet. Policy is taking action. We saw the, the presentation by Natalie Helberger on the Digital Services Act and so on. So there are things happening. There are things happening, but we are not there yet, unfortunately, to have this user trust uh, of these platforms. 
Yeah. Well, you are in Brussels, so later on we will uh, see you as a representative of, you know, the European, uh, uh, and we will talk more about European governance. But let's first move to London, where Alison Powell is joining us. And let's um, uh, take a look at this from the British perspective. Alison, would you like to shed your light on how we move from, you know, a, a different framework of professional institutional trust to that automated the corporate and the automated model of trust thank you that's a fantastic question um, and it's a really interesting question from the if you look at actually the function of platforms um, which is more my focus um, like you I'm also based in media and communication um, and have spent a long time working on um, the kinds of design of technological systems and reflecting on how that design is itself a kind of uh, communicative process, but also how the choices made within the design influence the whole um, dynamic of its use and indeed its governance. Um, and so when I think about um, the biggest challenge or problem with algorithmic governance, I think about the challenges of what are called non-determinate systems. So there are lots of different kinds of algorithmic systems, um, including ones where it's quite straightforward. You add some data, the data is processed, and there's an outcome. And there's a kind of linear relationship between that input and that output. But as we move increasingly to uh, machine learning systems or other kinds of learning-based systems, they are no longer determinate. So you put data into a system, and there's a machine learning process that is trained with that data that's looking for patterns and relationships between different elements in that data set. And that generates a model for predicting some other uh, relationship that's different and new that is based on that, train, that training data that sort of um, is used to structure that model. The problem is what comes out is not deterministically related to what goes in. Most people don't have a sense of whether there's a statistical pattern to how they engage with, for example, news on a news feed. They engage with news on a news feed as if it were a kind of information source that were parallel to anything else that they might find in a library. Um, and they also don't necessarily think about how, what, it, how, what is, might be recommended to them to read next isn't necessarily deterministically related to what they read previously. It's related, but there's not a sort of um, a very straightforward uh, kind of uh, process that you can sketch out that says the reason that you got that article was because you read three, these three articles. Um, and so in the special issue that you've just been talking about, I, I try to describe how designers in fact have to grapple with this uncertainty and how designers inside platform companies actually often don't themselves know entirely how these non-deterministic complex systems work. And this is a good example of what you just were speaking about, this idea of a shift from a kind of uh, institutionally based governance to a much more dynamic and distributed governance system where some of the governance is occurring through the design of the algorithmic system because this non-deterministic set of relationships is itself a kind of governance mechanism. It's influencing um, the ways that you are able to explain how you got from here to there. It's influencing the ways that you are able to define or enact transparency. And just to quickly give you an example from the British context, which we, we promise we are still Europeans, even though we're, we're, we're going to feel a little taken over at the moment by, by this ideology that likes to think of it as something else. Um, but our recent scandal uh, occurred over the summer when the final exams for secondary students uh, in the UK who were planning to go on to university were algorithmically assigned based on patterns in the performance of the uh, in the previous performance of the schools in which students were enrolled. So students were given grades that were not based on what they actually wrote in their exams, nor were they based on the previous performance of those actual students. The grades were based on some statistical relationships between the performance of previous students who had previously attended the same school and 
the grades that, that, uh, that, that could be predicted for this year. And can you imagine what happened? I mean, this was a national scandal. And it was a national scandal because of this non-determinacy. Nobody could figure out exactly how this happened. And it was very clear that the outcomes were biased, especially in cases when students went to very small schools or when students were from backgrounds where historically people with those backgrounds had previously not performed well on exams. And this is a way that kind of these algorithmic systems can reinscribe uh, kinds of social bias that we think of as having been solved. So we think of saying, oh, well, we'll fix the data set. So we won't have racial bias, for example, in our algorithm. But in this non-deterministic uh, system, you have associations that are, are in correlations that build up patterns that then say, well, this student's previously at that school in that lower income neighborhood that had lots of students from a minority ethnic background. Well, they had patterns of, of lower performance over time. So it is normal then, of course, that you know student X uh, doesn't get a passing grade, even if student X's per, uh, performance was far beyond the performance that previous people with the same characteristics might have had. So you can think about this in terms of what this does for questions about equality of outcome and other social justice questions. So I'll stop there, but- uh, <laughs> Huge to... question, of course. And I would like to ask Joe in a second to uh, respond to that. But um, of course, the, the real question you raise here, and this is something that occurred to me also while talking about the Corona app that uh, you did uh, talked about, is how deliberate are these mistakes? And coming back to your uh, presentation, are, and, and yours, of course, uh, Alison, are they part of the design? Are they part of the deliberate design of some of these technologies that we have turned into a part of our governance strategy, our governance systems? How deliberate, how conscious, how uh, governmental are these technologies actually? Can you, maybe Joe can respond to Alison first and then I will ask Stefan to uh, say something more. Yes, of course. So, yeah, hugely important example. I think you're giving Alison, and we all, unfortunately, we all know about this because this means it was such a disaster that it was kind of a, a scandal on a large scale. Uh, what I think, when the question is deliberate, is uh, what it at, at least shows is that designing means making choices, and choices are based on, in the context, what the, your example in in a, in a policy context on ideology, on what kind of uh, parameters are we going to take to decide on how things are being calculated eh? of all most often this happens in the back and people are uh, in the back office and people don't know about it here it became very prominent and people were affronted and were scandaled by it that it that, that this were the choices being made while most often you don't know about the choices being made uh, and so in that sense it's at least giving transparency and to my knowledge, I don't know the example very well, but at least some rectification has been done, meaning they abolished it and, and, and tried something else. And so when you talk about deliberate choices in algorithms on the level of private companies and, and corporate companies, of course, that's about the business model. It's about following the money and choices are being made because most often it's about advertising and creating more data for advertising. So it's not difficult to understand the choices being made there, but also most often there, or we don't know about them, we don't even get access to them, We as, even not we as researchers, which are already a big problem, I think. And second, people even know less about the choices being made, except when they become exposed by accident, like the example I gave, what's up being uh, by accident disclosing something apparently that people didn't know. So I think delib deliberate choices are being made and it's, it's making them transparent and, and how they are explained. And then that's also my, your main point, I think, Alison, is, so exp explanation as a, as, a, as a kind of governance and how is that taking place? Right, and that explanation, as I um, uh, gathered from Judith's explanation of the Corona app in Germany, and how that was implemented, that was part of the designing process. And that is by making that designing process of the Corona app open to the public, I, uh, is, uh, Judith, you pointed out that uh, there were many steps built into that process. Now. Perhaps I can ask Stefan, um, do you have a Corona app in, in Sweden and has it been a similar process to the one that Judith described in uh, Germany? 
Uh, no, we have. Well, we had first an attempt that uh, hasn't be, been really, really revealed why it failed because it was uh, started to be developed in an authority and then they scrapped that. Uh, no one really knows how much money they spent on it or why they really scrapped it. So that would be interesting to look at, but no one has been able to do it. Then we have more medical way, medical versions of Corona apps in the sense that people can say, uh, you know, be uh, deliberately say, yeah, I have had it and, and this is in the place of Sweden. So it's not this it's not the same as in Germany. It's not a uh, traditional or traditional, but yeah. not the tracing app style. I but see. I think the example is perfectly picked in terms of seeing how governmental ideas on anything, but in this case, tracing a, a, a pandemic is sort of in the hands of, you know, uh, large scale platforms and their design choices. Yeah. Well, in the meanwhile, people have been uh, filing questions in the Q&A, and let me uh, pick out one, which is uh, raised by Jonas Anderson Schwartz. Welcome, Jonas. We know each other. Hi, hi. Um, and his question is uh, raised to Alison. Based, Alison, based on your insightful and critical observation, would you say that machine learning systems are, by definition, conservative? Uh, for example, that they take observed often highly unequal patterns and reinforce these patterns. Could you comment on that? That's a really fascinating question. Um, I think it's possible. Uh, I'm just trying to hold on while I walk through this uh, provocation that you've given um, and sort of see how it holds. So your look, machine learning systems are looking for patterns and they're based on the data that goes in. So there is a bit of garbage in, garbage out that, uh, that applies in machine learning systems. Um, and I think that is one way where it is possible for machine learning systems to indeed be highly conservative, because if the training data is constrained um, or if the training data is biased, then the relationships are likely to kind of um, to operate within the universe that the training data creates. That's the best way to, that I can explain it is that the training data itself is a universe. So facial recognition systems for a very long time, you know, had a problem in not recognizing black and brown faces. They're still extremely bad at recognizing women's faces and specifically black and brown women's faces. The reason for this was that when they were first designed, most of the training data sets that, was, that were used to train facial recognition systems were of light-skinned people and men. They were web scraped off of often um, corporate websites with lots of headshots. Um, and then of course, lots of work in the, in the technical field of machine learning has since happened to try to expand the training data set for, machine, for facial recognition. Now there's, this is where your question becomes much more interesting. So if you have a very narrow training data set, it's going, the, the responses are going to come from the universe that that training data set gives you. So you have facial recognition systems that work on the universe of pale skinned male faces, and they are very highly effective in that universe and not effective outside that universe. You could expand the universe and have lots and lots of different faces. Then you have a different problem because then you have a problem of what do you, how do you recognize those faces? So the faces, so you can have better facial recognition um, of black and brown faces, but what are you doing with that recognition? And that is the second place where machine learning systems could be described as being conservative, which is of course the context into which they're set. So I think there is a kind of potential conservatism in the design of the technology itself because of the way that, that, uh, that machine learning systems have to draw inferences from the universe of data that goes in. But there's also a much bigger problem, which is the context in which that system is set overall. Okay, well, I hope Jonas, this is an answer to your question. If not, you can raise a second one. Um, we do have a second question, which um, I would like to pose to Judith. Um, it's asked by Björn Fritz in the Q&A, and he asks, uh, do you see a shift in how science in its move towards open science is also, create, also increasingly, sorry, also increasingly are being governed by algorithms on platforms? Judith, could you reply to this, respond to this question? 
I'm not sure, I, I'm not quite sure whether I get it entirely. So the question is whether also open science, well, that, that probably depends on, on what, maybe I'm not getting the question right. So maybe if in the Q&A, you can specify it if I got it wrong, uh, but it depends, I think a bit on what content of open science you're investigating. So, you know, is it open science in, let's say a media context, then probably this is the case because Let's assume, and I'm, you know, I'm just making this up. If you're doing research on social media, there are certain types of social media that are more accessible than others. For instance, Twitter feeds, at least a certain percentage of, uh, of, of Twitter feeds are freely accessible, whereas for others you have to pay, whereas other types of platforms are much less accessible. Um, so the availability of data has an impact of the type of research that is being conducted. So that would be uh, um, one, one of the most straightforward, but it's not necessarily a case of open science as I would understand it, because open science, you could also conceive to what extent, for instance, uh, does uh, climate research now rely on, on certain data being provided in the public and there, I'm not sure I, would, I could draw an easy link to, to the platforms and that type of research. So, I hope this, I'm feeling this is not entirely convincing, but it really depends a bit, I think, on, on, on what exactly meant, um, is meant by open science. But Stefan probably can say something better because he, he raised his hand. Okay, yeah, um, talking about raising hands, if you, uh, one of you wants to respond to each other, please raise your hand so I know who wants to respond to whom. So we're going to a second round of questions. There are no more Q &A, uh, uh, questions in the Q&A. Unfortunately, those of you who are attendees and not in the, among the panelists, you can't use the raise hand function, but of course you can put your questions in the Q&A and uh, I will be happy to read them to uh, one of the panelists. If you want to address a specific panelist, please let, let me know and I will do that. Now, we have talked a lot about, you know, that model and the, and the uh, problems with uh, algorithmic and corporate uh, models of um, uh, governance. In this round of, of questioning, I would like you to focus on solutions and recommendations for governing the platform societies of the future. Could you please, each of you, articulate two or three recommendations to the European Commission? And of course, Alison, you're welcome to join because we don't consider the UK to be, you know, we still consider you to be part of that uh, European Union. Um, in terms of how they could approach the governance of digital platforms. So now we're actually focused on, on how need, do we need to govern platforms? What should they take to heart when it comes to that kind of governance? And you can, you know, you can talk a bit freely and move free. We're here just amongst, you know, 30 or so people, but please post your recommendations to that highest governance level. And if there's something you would like to add from your national governance level, please feel free to do so. Um, uh, Alison, would you like to start? And please raise your hands when you would like to respond to each other. So um, I was actually going to re reflect on um, the real chat again on these kinds of challenges um, to effective response and governance that are posed by this shift away from institutional governance and more towards a distributed governance that involves the technologies themselves, the platform owners. And then, you know, it, to a potentially lesser extent, the um, national regulators and the and legal institutions. Um, because the research that I presented in the special issue was actually about how explanation um, potentially could be uh, one of the kind of governance levers to address this non-deterministic problem. Um, but we ran into some really big issues with investigating explanation in relation to these kinds of um, algorithmic systems. And the difficulty with explanation is of course that kind of space in between what goes into a machine learning system and what comes out. And if it's not a straightforward linear or deterministic relationship, then your main lever for accountability, which is, can we know really what's going on? And yo, your example of, of WhatsApp and Facebook is a really great example of the fact that people actually do make inferences about what is going on. And they say, oh, I thought WhatsApp was this thing by itself. Oh no, Facebook is going to take my data out of WhatsApp. Well, of course, Facebook had already acquired WhatsApp. So there was already a kind of platform-based relationship. So 
people will make their kind of inferential um, assumptions about what's actually going on, which is why explanations seem like they might be a really good idea. But when you have this kind of like very unstable relationship between what is what is actually going into a system and the result that's coming out of it, then you have a gap, which is very difficult to fill in terms of how you are going to govern. Uh, so in the research that I did that I that I wrote up um, in the special issue, we we were actually speculating about whether we needed a different kind of governing intermediary for this distributed governance and whether we could have we could imagine creating an intermediary that would be able to shift or comment on or stop the function of a machine learning model in a particular setting. And this is a really powerful kind of mental um, model for a response to this new governance situation. But it has many, many challenges, uh, not least of which, how will you define and position an intermediary into what remains a kind of black box? What sort of expertise would this kind of interme intermediary need? What would be the re reporting requirements on, for example, training data used, the, the different kinds of many complex models that machine learning systems actually use um, to this, this intermediary? And how would they define a kind of public or common good? Um, and I guess I don't have any answers to those significant problems, but I think the provocation of thinking about some other intermediary that, that kind of moves around and within this distributed governance system is a very useful uh, kind of thought experiment for us to engage in as we try to grapple with the massive shift away from the institutions of governance that we've had thus far. Well, wow, that is a, a very good beginning of an answer, certainly to post to uh, the EU. You did. You wanted to respond to uh, Alison's. Yeah, I thought I should take the occasion because it's actually a very interesting point about explanation, but also the underlying issue which he mentions about deterministic versus probabilistic uh, links or, you know, providing explanations and, and what, what really um, what really interests me, what I don't have an answer to, is to what extent actually this is a novel issue in regards to ADM and machine learning. Because for instance, everything that is statistic based and making inferences based on statistics has the same characteristics. You're making inferences for an individual based upon data from a different population. So actually there is nothing new, but what seems to be very pressing about this case uh, of, the, of the British schools is basically that you take an average from other people to make a prediction for an individual performance where you actually would have had individual performance points. So the problem is not really not being deterministic, but rather using the, the, the wrong the type of data in order to make a prediction. So I think this is a very interesting point that some issues are not really that new because they, they are basically baked into all types of probabilistic inferences which we are making. And, and this brings the first problem to explanation, but the second is really, um, if you want to provide explanation, you have two barriers for that in terms of machine learning systems. One is really um, th this lack of explainability in AI because the, you know it's not transparent how certain predictions are being made. The second is that has also been implicit that a lot of these um, software is proprietary, so you can't look into irrespective of whether they are deterministic or not, but just because you don't have the right to do so. And then the problem is if you want to provide an explanation, this the, the, the concept of explanation is, is context, purpose, and, and agent sensitive. So you have to really make sure that your explanation fits the purpose. So what do you want to be explained for? Is it somebody who is denied a credit? This person wants to know why the hell did I not get a credit, which is a very different kind of explanation as an auditor who wants to know, is this software not systematically discriminating people against? So, so what I'm trying to get at is there's a lot of work in, in, in explainable AI and it's important, but it can't answer all of these questions. So that was not, uh, Josie, I hope that's okay. No, that's not. to your original question about a response to Alison, <laughs> which I found really interesting. That's actually just fine. We will uh, improvise a bit anyway, because I, uh, on top of this, I got a really interesting question in the um, in the Q and A, which and I will read it here. It's asked by Adam Kelly, and I think it's 
you know, it's about the, uh, the, the example that uh, Alison just gave. The, and he writes, the liberal idea of meritocracy is under increasing pressure on the left and the right these days. So in recent years, there have been a number of books, you know, along the line of Michael Sandel's The Tyranny of Merit, etc. So, and the question is, do algorithms signal the final death knell of meritocracy because of the patterning that Alison identified and its orientation towards conservatism and bias? And I think that really fits in nicely with what Judith just asked. Are algorithms sort of pushing us towards, you know, discrimination, to, towards um, uh, a conservative bias? What exactly is the way, in what way are they pushing us? Um, maybe, Stefan, would you like to pick up on this? Yeah, I could, I could do that. Come back to uh, Alison later. <laughs> Trying to pick up uh, multiple, uh, I think, uh, points you made. Uh, also, for example, Joe mentioned um, WhatsApp and sort of are the data collection in line with the user intent or Alison's uh, attempt of explanation if you have a like a biased small data set and then the solution from an engineering perspective would might be, okay, we just need more data. We, okay, we need to complement this with a million faces from women. So, it, you know, in the terms of this, I think that uh, a problem from a, a recommendation for the EU would be, yeah, this, this hits so many dif different types of regulations, which tends to be developed in parallel. I see that as a problem. So you have uh, notions of com competition law, which I write in my paper on, that's uh, so closely here related to data protection regulation, also consumer uh, protection. But if we continue to develop laws in, in silos in the sense, and also implement them in silos, but also supervise the markets from authorities in silos, which uh, by the way, is one challenge in Sweden, I think. We have different authorities for all of these fields. That means that no one has the overview of this sort of combined problem, uh, which deals with automation and algorithmic learning from data, which feeds the sort of business models of the large scale platforms. But no one can really see the, the pie. We just see pieces of the pie, um, which is the governance issue. So the recommendation would be, yeah, try to reassess, find bridges between the, the, the regulatory areas. Um, Otherwise, you will develop four new silos or in line with four new silos uh, and uh, never target the entire challenge you face. And I did not really, I think, answer Adam Kelly's. I was just thinking about uh, Judith and Joe <laughs> and Alison's We will, question we will go back to Alison soon, but I first yeah. saw Joe uh, raising his hand. And I would like, I would like to add, uh, I see in the background, Stefan, in your background, uh, I see a sign reading AIEU which I think is yeah. a nice sort of switch to where I, your background in uh, uh, Jo's background is actually in Brussels. I see the EU, well, it's not the EU building. I know it's the VUB in Brussels, but um, Jo, moving to your center, the heart of Europe and the European Union, what would your response be? Yes, I, I want to pick up on, uh, on the comment made by Alison and also uh, link to what Stefan just said. I know Stefan's expertise is also on competition policy and. And when he talks about Cyrus, I think what he, I assume what he's also referring to is that, and it's being debated also in policy research that we need to, to some extent also, you have published about this, uh, Jose, we need to get rid of these silos of different kinds of policy, competition versus data privacy versus consumer rights and so on. And so what we need, and that links up to what uh, Alison uh, proposes is this kind of government intermediary that has the kind of authority to look into this from different angles uh, that are at stake and meaning are consumers protected is competition still held up and that people have alternatives uh, meaning that the gatekeepers are not too powerful uh, is, is privacy as a fundamental fundamental right being protected and so on and so I, I do think one of the issues at hand and you see this more or less coming into being but very slowly that the silos are broken down to some extent I think uh, in, in that regard, uh, referring to the work of Gillespie on, on, on custodians of the internet and so on. So how to, to take care of these issues in a kind of more holistic way. Um, and then of course the issues also, and this again also being said earlier, what is then built into these algorithms, the, 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 the value of public good, of public value of common good or so, how to take care of this? And, we all know, yeah, we don't want these platforms to take care of content. We don't want them to be the sensors of content in a way. 
but what do they need to do then? And of course, then you come into the heart of the issue. They need to take care of what are the algorithms doing. And one of the foremost things that's been also proposed by other scholars is at least taking care of acceleration of bad content, of of the of disinformation, of hate, hate speech, and so on. So they have the powers to do that. And if that's the first thing that we need to do. But in order that they do that, of course, they need some oversight and have the in the in having these intermediaries taking care of it would be a good first step. But this requires then openness from their side into their system in one way or another. Uh, and that's we, we do not have that yet because indeed they, they immediately start saying a trade secret and you can't enter. But you could organize it as an oversight body that there is some action on that in a way. And I expect, uh, from, at least from a European level, that they should have the leverage of taking action on that in that regard, I would say. So you do you argue, in other words, that we need a Ministry of uh, Digital Affairs at the EU level or at the national level, not just the Commissioner for Markets and uh, Antitrust and Competition? Would that be a solution? It's, it seems like a possible solution. We have a Minister of Mobility, of, 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 of Media Infrastructures, Digital Infrastructures, Digital Affairs, as they are so embedded in so many sectors seems quite logical that at least some responsibility should be organized in that regard, I would say. Okay. Alison, how would you respond to that? And also sort of taking this, this view from the, this perspective from the UK. Sorry to, uh, to uh, emphasize it once again. I don't mean to hurt you, but uh, okay. it is an important, I, you know, it the, is the, an important the, issue. The everyday <laughs> trauma is enough, Jose. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, this idea... I think we, there's also likely going to be a kind of really difficult dance between the the kinds of you know state level regulatory authorities, um, the national level regulatory authorities, and the platform companies themselves. And you can see how this dance has already unfolded uh, in the past several years as platform companies seek to shift where they're operating from so that they can operate under the terms of different data protection authorities, for example. Um, and I and I also think there that, you know, you know, we have other issues include how data is actually moving um, from country to country and from jurisdiction to jurisdiction without getting into too much of the weeds of the consequences of the UK leaving the European Union. You know, there are massive issues with moving data that has already, you know, the data no longer has free movement either, not only the people. And I think this is becoming increasingly uh, complex. And it's something that our colleague, um, Jean-Christophe Plantin talks about in his contribution to our special issue, where he talks about the um, logic of platformization and the way that it works at kind of supranational governance levels where platform companies navigate as if they were states in a certain way. Um, and so the, the, these dynamics, I think, will become much more intense. Um, and I think the, uh, inevitably, the UK will take a kind of pragmatic approach, which will probably be to kind of shadow many of the sort of um, data protection um, features that, are, that were already negotiated over the last several decades. But that doesn't change the dynamic of the platform companies themselves seeking to intervene and looking for ways to negotiate, for example, more, uh, you know, what they perceive as more favorable uh, um, terms for, for uh, using data as the data moves across, you know, across the globe. In fact, we haven't even talked about uh, Chinese technology companies right. in the mix. Well, that would that will make it more complicated. We may do that though later. But I would like to um, take up a pick up a question from the Q and A box because it's sort of a nice bridge to our next point of discussion, and uh, it's uh, posed by Adam Kelly. Um, Adam asks, Stefan and Jo's points about governance is a two-sided one. One of the big claims for distributed systems is, is precisely that they can't be governed and therefore are less open to the bias of people and institutions. I think, for, I think Bitcoin is a very good example here. In an age when people seem to be mistrusting institutional governance more than ever, how can we do governance in a way that produces more trust, not less? 
would distributed trust, if such a thing exists, and that is really a major question, would distributed trust be something new and different to institutional trust? And that is exactly, I would say, I would like to point out, that is one of the main issues that we are raising, the questions that we're raising in that special issue of the European Journal of Communication that is uh, upcoming. Stefan, as a lawyer, would you like to pick up this question? Yeah, it's a very good question. Uh, I, first, I, maybe I should just clarify in terms of I'm not done with institutional trust yet. Uh, it's just because I see there are so many um, um, low level uh, possible developments that can be done first. I, I uh, advise a couple of authorities in Sweden and I see that it's not that the legal provisions would not be able to target some of the issues. It's more like the supervisory abilities uh, struggle with seeing it. So it's more... Um, tools and competence, I'd say that would be, it's not, that's not a magical answer, right? It's just, um, we need to improve the supervisory abilities to imply or um, uh, implement stuff that's already been regulated. I think that's one clear step, which would not be in line with uh, Adam's question, Danny. We don't need to shift in a binary mode over to to sort of some, some model of distributed trust. But that being said, I also see a bunch of studies and have performed some of them on myself when how consumers, into, you know, understand how their own data uh, being collected, for example, in retail. And and the, the, the worry that people express uh, in that, that type of studies is, is sort of a lack of control. So it's not that uh, they, they uh, not necessarily don't want to get parts of that personalized uh, service, but it's just that they don't know what they get from the data that the third party, the fourth party, someone else, you know, collects and, and does things with. So the lack of control would, uh, to me, imply that, yeah, maybe we should at least rethink some aspects of distributed control in that sense, or distributed trust in the sense, could we add control mechanisms for individuals in a sense that don't mean 4,000 more cookie consent uh, right. requests uh, to read. <laughs> Anyone who would like to respond to this? Uh, I see Jo, yeah, please. Yes. Uh, Can you raise your hand? Yes, thank you. Uh, no, indeed. So when you talk about control, uh, Stefan, I, I just referring to uh, in Flanders, we have this yearly uh, study on understanding what people, how people engage with digital media. And, and the last one, again, as in many other countries, I assume, indicated that, that two-thirds indeed have the feeling of no control of what is happening with data, if, if they know at all. And, and even three quarters saying uh, of a representative sample in Flanders, uh, so indicate that companies are not transparent about how they're controlling and are collecting data. So there is a general feeling indeed among the public that not sure what is happening there, of course, not able to do something about it because it's out of their hands, but the general sense is that, yeah, something is wrong here. Uh, and I, I don't know what to do about it, but there's something is wrong. And so in that sense, yeah, there is action needed. And when you talk about uh, this, the distributed trust, trust issue, which really asked the question by Adam, I think, I'm not sure if it is, it's really an answer to the question, but at least it reminded me of some also some uh, proposals in that regard, also Jose has been dealing with this issue, is that one of the first steps you could uh, you could expect from a, a government like, of, like a, a policy body like Europe is at least demanding interoperability, meaning that you avoid these systems being locked into some kind of silo, which they want to do. They want to have what is again called intraoperability, but you would expect at least from a policy side, some in, in initiative that forcing them to connect to each other in one way or another, as, as, as we do in telecoms, as we do in other kinds of sectors, but that would be a first step because at the moment, of course, we have very few players there. It's, it's a, we all know it's an oligopoly and we and it's not, not much to do about it. And it will not soon happen that Europe will have an alternative, uh, public alternative to these platforms. So the first step could be at least asking them to having some interaction and making it possible. But of course, this is only first step. We need also that insight in what is happening to these data in one way or another uh, as a kind of a way to, 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 gain, to regain control, you could say. Yeah, that regaining control, I think, is a very important issue. And it's particularly important because it 
um, sort of allows you to regain trust as a government or as an institution, particularly when we look at different institutions like, uh, you know, public institutions like education or health. It's very important that they regain that trust, but also that they learn something, for instance, from platform companies and their governance. Now, let me make take this bridge to uh, ask you a, sort of a, a, another broad question, which I would like you to reflect on, and please take your time. Um, let's talk about that issue of reshaping trust. How do you think that platform companies, or even more specifically, major social media platform networks, some of you have been focusing on specifically social media networks, how can they they also need to regain trust because they have been having a lot of flack, you know, for their lack of trust. They have been major, there have been major scandals, not just for disinformation and fake news, but a lot, on a lot of other accounts. Should they actually invest in, for instance, institutional checks and balances? Can they learn from the institutional model to regain trust and to sort of regain trust with an audience that will um, not, you know, leave social networks if they're not capable of, of, of uh, setting standards for trust? On the other hand, I think there's institutions in the institutional frame they could learn from how uh, uh, algorithms and social media platforms um, particularly implement certain systems in um, in order to give people more power to you know give them more affordances to act that could both systems actually learn from each other in terms of reshaping trust gaining trust how could you how would you what, what, what do you have to say on that and Perhaps we should start with that. Judith, would you like to start reflecting on that question? And please put your uh, uh, questions in the Q&A if you would like to participate in the conversation. And maybe my first reaction would be that actually, I don't think that these companies for the moment should initially strive for getting more trust, but rather for becoming trustworthy. Um, because what I actually see is currently, to my mind, there is still too much trust in these services. <laughs> Um, and actually too much blind trust or reliance on actually untrustworthy systems. So I would possibly rephrase it initially and say, we need to find means in order to raise the trustworthiness of those providers so that they can hope to get more justified trust at the very end. So that would be my initial reaction. The question is then, how do you basically get towards more trustworthy systems? And this is a question of how radical you want to be, right? So on the less radical realm, you could say, well, you know, we need more participation, right? We need to have, let's say, social media councils, and they should, you know, sort of like have a say in how decisions are being made about what's taken down, what, you know, about the curation criteria, stuff like that. So that would be, I think, the minimal what you should strive for. You could ask for something like a, like a, a sort of like um, something similar, the, the GDPR equivalent of, of, let's say, algorithmic auditing, in which you could say, well, to a certain degree, we need some auditing, depending on critical certain, uh, certain algorithms are. And to, you can argue that they are critical if they affect public opinion, then there should be some form of oversight and you need to come up with, with sort of like how, how, how these boards should function, whether you need real time assessment, what types of, you know, what type of information should be provided to whom. So this all already is not very likely to go through. But for me, this is on the less radical side. If you were to become more radical, I think you would either have to have public alternatives and infrastructures that sort of like work differently. Um, for instance, in the uh, German public broadcasting system, you have some tracking free websites. Um, so that I think would be very essential. And I think the only thing that really works if you just don't want to tinker along all the way and just, you know, tinker a bit here and tinker a bit there, is just you basically have to ban all this online uh, tracking and, and the whole system of online advertisement, which basically means you need to kill a certain industry. Um, which I think is the underlying issue because the problem is not personalized advertisement, right? This is not the issue. The issue is what you need to gather in order to do something as stupid as personalized advertisement. So basically I'd say the merits of personalized advertisement is really minimal. So it can't be justified that this minimal, you know, incentive of having personalized ads can justify the massive amount of tracking. So if you really want to change something, I just think you need to block this whole system and destroy that. But, you know, me just saying, you know, whatever can be realistic, but I would have a say, I would go that route. Okay, Alison, um, uh, Judith pointed out a number of sort of mild um, uh, protection measures, all the way to very wild and, and very stringent uh, measures. What would you like to, what would your solution be? How, how can we reshape trust? 
So I'm going to just go with what Judith said and then add in an extra layer of radical um, approach, which is that I think you should be able to not have, uh, you know, some of your um, decisions be made with certain types of decision systems. I think they're, you know, so so there. This is also, I guess, building from what Judith was talking about in relation to um, to personalized advertising. Personalized advertising is the Trojan horse for pervasive surveillance, right? So you know, you say, oh well, I, you know, we'll just collect all of the information that we could ever possibly want about everything that you do on the web just in case you want a second pair of gray, silk, gray, you know, low heeled boots. I already have some boots, so it's all right. Like I don't need another pair. So I don't need the personalized advertising, but underneath it, it is of course, collecting all this information, which we know is being held just in case it's used to train an as yet unknown system for an as yet unknown purpose. Well, that is really not a very good bargain in terms of consent. Um, so I think it should be possible to, um, to position a set of governance options on an arc from complete refusal to a kind of remediation approach, which is a bit what Judith was talking about at the beginning um, in relation to uh, advertising. So the remediation approach for public sector algorithms might be to have a training data registry that for all the training data that's used to train particular systems in a particular context. This draws on what um, Judith was talking about as the kind of pillars of explainability, context, purpose, and agent. So if you could define the context, purpose, and agent for a particular set of um, you know, automated decisions, you could then flag a, a training data registry in relation to those features. So that would be on the remediation end. And in the public sector context, you could imagine how that would that would be. Um, you could develop a regulatory framework around that that would be very specific. But on the other end of the arc is the ability to say, because I don't know what sorts of different kinds of biases might be generated by this automated system, I would prefer to have an the automated system not used which is the sort of right of refusal. Um, and we know, of, of course, that humans are very biased. And one of the reasons why in the public sector automated decisions have been introduced is in part because humans are very biased and our cultures give us signals that, that of course, are sorting our responses um, in ways that we don't necessarily uh, recognize. Still, I think it's worth uh, a kind of having a real conversation about that and what is the what are the real conversations that we need to have about systemic injustice you know about people's in, inherent biases and about the sorts of social systems that we have built um, around ourselves that we are so concerned about that we would wish to replace them with automated systems that produce all kinds of other problems <laughs> to which we have absolutely no um, you know, we, we have not yet developed the appropriate social responses. We know what the appropriate social responses to racism, sexism, and systemic injustice are. They're just really hard. So I just, I, you know, I'm going to suggest um, everything that Judith said plus that. <laughs> well, that is quite radical. Yo, you wanted to respond to this. Yo, unmute yourself. I really like the intervention, both interventions, and I, I do think, and, and that's really nice that Judith also touched upon this issue about uh, tracking, because it's a huge issue at the moment with the revision of the e-privacy regulation, where also the European data protection authorities now uh, suggest to abolish the whole system, especially or uh, programmatic buying and all the rest happening. So where these kind of tracking is happening behind the scenes in a very opaque way and you have no ideas how it is happening. You see it on the level of policy, but you also see it on the level of, of, of companies, the whole issue with uh, Apple's ATT, so the app tracking transparency, which they now demand from every app on their platform being uh, an opt-in that people, if they want to still have 
apps like the ones from Facebook connecting data from one app to the other app and outside even the app I can, uh, ecosystem, they have to opt in. They have to say it's okay for me, and it's, it creates a huge uh, panic in the, in, the, in the advertising field at the moment because the, the first are uh, the big losers in that uh, of money will be Facebook, Amazon, and, and Alphabet in this regard. Um, so you see that there's a lot of things on that level, at least already happening. Uh, finally acknowledging something is really wrong here. There's a, a degree of surveillance, which is totally not proportional um, and some action needs to be taken. So I think even you you claim it as something being radical, Judith, Judith I, I do think some interesting things are happening on that in that regard. When you talk about public alternatives, there was last week or the week before that a really interesting conference where also Jose participated in and in the Netherlands. They have a great initiative where they try to bring together different public institutions, museums, libraries, public authorities on sharing experiences on platforms that start from a kind of a common interest or public interest instead of having to fall back on each time again a, a private platform which, which they don't control. So, can we develop something as an alternative? It's, it's a slow process also in that sense, because it's not easy to, to, to go against these huge uh, companies that have a lot of, 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 of funding, of course, to develop convenient, user-friendly kind of platforms. But at least also on that level, you see things are happening. So I do think there are some promising things, but it's a long way to go in that regard still. I yeah. must the initiative that uh, Yo is mentioning is actually called Public Spaces. You can look it up. It's one word, Public Spaces. And it's indeed uh, arguing that we need uh, different platforms for, and uh, we need actually publicly, uh, well, platforms that are based on public values rather than on commercial values like personalization. Um, so um, talking about that kind of trust and i would like to bring the question of governance back to the uh, to the discussion um now first i would like to give uh, judith the word because you raised your hand you had some response yeah. to what joe was just saying I, I just wanted to say that of course none of these ideas are mine so if i phrase them as radical <laughs> it's more that i don't see them coming straight forward so just that nobody misunderstood that i'm coming up with these radical ideas i know there are a number of people who are proposing all these things so i just wanted to be transparent about it it's more that i I think getting this through on a political basis, that's what I deem more radical, not that these initiatives are not already taking place. So this was more, more of a small caveat, which I wanted to add. Right. They're definitely not so radical anymore. And I think it's really, there's really sort of, it's the opportune time now to, to talk about those initiatives and talk about these alternatives, because many people, especially in the uh, European zone, are actually talking about public alternatives, also to infrastructures. And we have only uh, touched on this, this particular issue very briefly, but what about the infrastructures that many of these platforms actually rely upon? You know, I'm not just talking about cables and uh, networks and like hardware, but also about things like cloud services about um you know in fact what we have seen is that social networks have become social infrastructures more or less they are becoming social infrastructures to our uh, uh, our societies do we and, and now talking going back to the idea i think stefan and i would like to pose this question to stefan because he was bringing it up institutions you just said say stefan um, need to not just give away the initiative to um, uh, automated platforms. How can institutions take back that initiative? And particularly with regards to um, the infrastructure of, of for instance, uh, um, uh, platforms. Could you respond to that? And how could they take back that public space on these infrastructures? I, um, I think, um, well, it's a good question, better question than my answer probably will be, but uh, I'm thinking about also the, the question, what should we do from a public sector perspective to sort of change the, the markets? And I think that the problem with the radical ideas sometimes is that they tend more, the, 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 the trouble is how feasible they are in a market where consumers don't know what the data are collected so they can't choose anything else and they get stuff that works very well for free so it's very hard to regulate away stuff that everyone seems to choose right so from a more sort of a so i, I think that question is great but the sense 
uh, sense of how to steer it, uh, govern it from, a, from, from my perspective would be that I'm really curious about these uh, antitrust or competition regulatory proposals, because in one way they could possibly force more transparency on the very large platforms so that competitors can offer something else that consumers understand or something else. So I would, I would go for, you know, a transparency issue we've been talking about today in, in various uh, nuances, but I think that's one of the core issues, how to make, you know, show or explain or visualize how these markets works, what the data collected travels and what it's sort of purpose of it. So that also everyday humans can understand that, yeah, I understand that the role here that I'm playing, I'm not really comfortable with. I would preferably choose something else. And that would be a different way of governance. It would not be saying new law, forget about that, but sort of stimulate or try to at least in a hopeful manner say that, yeah, um, those who are depending on these large scale, in, you know, in fact, having become infrastructures for every, not only every humans, but also every companies, they need search, they need cloud infrastructure, right. they need retail markets, but to sort of show that transparency so so we can choose something else. That yeah. would be, I'm hopeful about it at least. And are you, Stefan, are you arguing that, for instance, public sectors should develop their own um, infrastructures based on public values? Or do you think they would rather, they could rather sort of uh, articulate the conditions on which these uh, infrastructures need to be developed and need to be made uh, suitable for public purposes? Yeah, I'm more hopeful about, about the second one. Uh, although for, for some cases, possibly you could have the, you know, the first, like uh, some parts of healthcare and sort of critical um, parts of public sector, but not all, because I don't think that we could have like a Swedish search engine that would be great, you know? So, so preferably setting or strengthening the, the governance of already present market-based versions um, for it. That would be my option. Okay, um, there's a few more questions in the Q&A um, and they're actually, they're sort of uh, uh, going away from what we were just talking about, but maybe this question fits in with what either Judith or Alison was just uh, explaining. Um, this is David Dyer Lawson who says, I wondered what the panel might advocate regarding the protections for people with disabilities, especially in the context of AI uh, bias and stigma against this group. Can uh, either of you perhaps respond to this particular question of uh, people with disabilities? I can respond in part because um, currently I'm working um, on the Just AI project in partnership with the Ada Lovelace Institute. and. My colleague Louise Hickman is um, a disability uh, studies scholar, um, as well as a, a scholar of AI ethics. And she's been leading a, a reading group working on this question of rights, access and refusal in relation to AI technologies. And so they have actually done quite a lot of work already uh, thinking about the uh, quality of access, um, the representation of disabled people within data and also this kind of dynamic that Judith and I were both talking about the dynamic of the the data that is used in automated systems and the context in which they are used um, and so one thing that that group is looking at is the um, register in the UK of vulnerable people and how that register of vulnerable people is aggregating different kinds of data together and categorizing people in ways that they may not have chosen to be categorized. And this is a really interesting question again for this idea of, you know, how does how do public sector AIs build up the kind of universe that they're using um, to make decisions and how does that get shaped? Because if people have not thought of themselves, for example, as vulnerable, um, instead thinking of themselves as people living with a disability, suddenly to be kind of recategorized in a certain way and then having probabilistic decisions made based on this categorization is really very destabilizing and actually recasts people's rights in a way. Um, and so it's a fascinating question, um, David. I, I think that, that some of the questions might have to do with um, shifting the mechanisms of consent um, and, and providing ways for people to uh, 
na navigate their representation within certain data, given the shifting context that that data is embedded in. And I guess the reason that the Register for Vulnerable People in the UK has been so interesting in this regard is that it was used not by the public sector, but by the private sector early in the pandemic to determine who could get access to, to scarce grocery delivery uh, slots. So there's very interesting questions here that are that are kind of generally about the relationship between public and private actors in this platform ecology, but also really kind of focused very specifically um, in this uh, kind of gap in terms of how people are consenting to be represented and then to be acted upon. Okay, thanks. Any of you would like to respond to what we've been hearing before? Because I think I gave all four of you a turn in responding to that open question. Um, there's one question that's coming to me from a different channel, but that is about the Facebook oversight board. Uh, there was some talk this morning about self-governance and uh, you know, the way in which that some of these companies have been uh, implementing some uh, self-regulation mechanisms, particularly the Facebook Oversight Board, who is much, you know, the topic of a discussion right now. What do you think on, of, of self-governance of platform companies in terms of, you know, sort of on the one hand, opening up to the public and sort of explaining and trying to be accountable for what they do, and on the other hand, just keeping a tight uh, control over what they do and how they implement this these kind of uh, self-governing services more or less whom of you would like to respond to that question stefan yeah just a few i mean on the one hand um there are uh, there are a bunch of positive uh, parts of uh, the attempt of taking accountability in a sense you want you want them to at least because because some of the, the scandals we've seen have been surprises also to the large scale players right so at least uh, they don't want to be surprised by their own uh, effects of their own tools in a sense so uh, the problem i'd see would be i mean the, making my first sort of social legal comment uh, on in terms of um, i don't know i could refer back to montesquieu how do you division power in a state, uh, the challenge here would be that the division of power is not so clearly, uh, it's not a clear division, right? You have the court system and the king in the same room, I guess. So the problem would be how, what happens when the court uh, takes decisions that differ from the growth um, a notion of, 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 of the commercial company. That would be, uh, it, would, they, are, would they be ready to, to diminish the growth if, if the internal court says uh, this is not okay? We don't know that yet. So, but still, in the same, I can't say that I would not. You know, it's not all bad. I, I'm curious about it, and I'm more. Uh, I want to see what it leads, in a sense. But mm -hmm. the, the problem still remains. They are, you know, billion people rich uh, entities, <laughs> and they are so big. So, no, our under other jurisdictions can really assess right. what's going uh, on. Yeah. Well, so, um, you did on your scale from very mild to very radical solutions. Would an oversight board and self-regulation, as such, where would that be on your on your scale? Yeah, between one and minus five, right? I mean, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm notoriously skeptical of self-regulation if it if it hits the core of the business model of a company, right? You can do all sorts of self-regulation that is not at the core of your business model. But if you're a company that deals with data, expecting them to be very sharp in regards to their business model is is just you know, not what is going to happen. So if you look into self-regulation, the rules of the game really matter. Like what exactly, how is this board set up? What are the rights? Who, first of all, who's on it, who's on the board and what is their say? Like, is this meant, you know, basically if they say something, is the company bound to execute this or not? What are they discussing? Is this merely about, you know, taking down uh, content or not? Or is it also cutting into their business model? So, you know, th the question of what the role of these boards can be depends a lot on the specificities of the board. So far empirically, I'm notoriously skeptical um, because it's very often a way of avoiding hard regulation by just, you know, saying we have another app ethics board and that says the professor for ethics of IT right so they, there is a lot of misuse of the term of ethics um, in terms of you know we'd rather have 
soft ethics instead of having hard law or rather having this instead of political engagement on certain matters, which I think is not, you know, ethics to blame for, but a misuse of the term, so to speak. So that, you know, just to be very precise, but in principle, you know, it, boards are fine, uh, but it can be a means of either avoiding hard regulation of delegating tasks that you actually should do yourself. Um, so you need to, and, and companies who have a history of not being very trustworthy in their practices, those are the least I trust with having a substantial board. Thank you. And Jo, I saw your hand raised. You would like to reflect on the self-regulation issue. Yes, I fully agree with Judith in this sense. I think we need to be very skeptical, especially when it touches upon their lifeblood and their business model and what they do with it and very, be very yeah, attentive of what is happening there and not avoiding some kind of whitewashing of uh, and this kind of thing. Uh, although, of course, the, the advantage always of, of self-regulation is the, the, the agility, the speed of which it can react to changes in technology and what it's it, what the, the, the impact on society. But I think if we want to go that direction, I think a better way would to go is what is called co-regulation. I mean, so you kind of give some initiative to companies because they know the best how to handle technology and address certain issues. But then you, you, you kind of demand that the government steps in to control that. So they set up some standards for themselves and you give them the authority to governments then to, to have a look at are they upholding the standards and giving punishments if they don't do. And of course, this then also require, requires transparency and, and openness about what they are doing, at least to that oversight body that has the control. So in that sense, if you want to go that direction, I think a better solution is to, to do some kind of co-regulation where you can yeah, involve some oversight and not leave it all, not leaving all the initiatives to only the people that, yeah, that, have been, that are beneficial about the things they are doing. Okay, thanks. We're sort of near towards, you know, we're coming towards the end of this discussion, but I would like to give each of you, each four of you, uh, just half a minute, like 30 seconds, one minute to give your last very good advice to either level, you know, to the European level, to the national level, you can give it to me, you can give it to users of platforms. What is your best advice for the future? Alison, may I start with you? Oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'll put you on the spot. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I think um, I'm going to echo Judith again and say, don't let, you know, don't assume that adding ethics and stirring is going to uh, change the structural um, difficulties of embedding your responsibility to your citizens. I'm thinking about public sector decision making uh, into automated systems. And so keep those human rights principles um, first and foremost, and allow us to refuse if that is in best line with our rights. Well, thank you for sharing your recipe and the ingredients at least. Uh, Stefan, what is your recipe? I like Joe's uh, co uh, co regulation uh, uh, advocacy because I'm I'm still uh, very much an advocate for improved supervisory abilities. Um, I see uh, that we have regulations that would work pretty well for many for some of these issues at least. And 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 but I also work with uh, supervisory authorities in Sweden. And I see that they are too siloed. They don't talk too much, especially not for the issues that tend to lean on. The other side, then they avoid it. So more supervisory abilities. That would be competence and sort of well, data, uh, computer software tools, or like more access on it. So sounds abilities, like empowerment a, of the supervisory abilities. Right. Sounds like a really good recipe. Judith, what would your uh, greatest hits be? Probably to destroy online marketing, uh, because I think this is the kernel of a lot of problems. Um, so, you know, destroying this and coming up with another viable and fair way of, of funding and sort of like, um, because, you know, services need to get paid for. So if we destroy this, we have to come up with a new business model of, of services that is fair, that doesn't exclude people, that doesn't make privacy, you know, something that you need to pay for, so to speak, uh, if you can afford it. So I think that would be, for me, the most pressing one, because some of the other issues follow from that. Thank you. And finally, Jo, your best advice. Well, if, to make it concrete as possible, and something we might want to look in more deeply is public procurement. So public sectors are buying technologies also more and more, and, and COVID has accelerated this tenfold. 
but this buying is not without consequences. And when you do property procurement, we might want to set much, high, set much higher standards on data processing agreements, for example, or on data protect impact assessments, or on other kinds of public values we want to safeguard when implementing and integrating these new structures, mostly commercially driven, but at least trying to protect them when making an agreement, looking closely into the agreement, what can we expect from that company? What will what we do we expect from the company? I think that is an interesting first step going forward from a public sector perspective. Thank you very much. Well, I hope, you know, whoever is listening and who, who will be looking at the recording will take this to heart. I would like to thank all four of, your, of you, Alison Powell, Joe Pearson, Stefan Larson, Judith Simon. Thank you very much for joining us from London, from Brussels, from Lund in Sweden and from Hamburg. It was a truly international European perspective on platform societies and, uh, and keeping trust. And uh, we're very much looking forward to the special issue, which will be published by the European Journal of Communication um, within three or four months. So please look, for, look out for it. It was a pleasure to talk to you and thank you very much for being here.